Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 848. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today is March 19th, 2024. All right, welcome to another show of Anglican Unscripted. We are very glad you could be here and join us as we tell you the news that's going on around the world. This is Kevin and George's happy place. We sit down and read the news that we find interesting around the world on our little webcams, and many of you seem to like that. Some of you agree with us completely about our take. Some of you kind of slightly agree with us, and some of you, a very small portion of the audience, think we're completely idiots. And we, we love that you think that <laughs> we're idiotic enough that you can come and join us. So we, we do appreciate that. The show here does not end when I press the, the stop button and I upload it. People go to the comments and there's wonderful conversations that happen uh, each episode uh, in the comments. And it, each episode goes for two or three weeks with all the comments that occur. We really appreciate that. We really read every comment and uh, we respond to those that we need to respond to. Let's see. Oh, huh. what should you do if you're a viewer of Anglican Unscripted? Like us. If you're watching the live stream or you're watching an episode or whatever, just click that little like button. It tells YouTube or Facebook that we are something worth watching, that they can uh, do free advertising for us. And it's really appreciated. If you have not done so yet, and uh, some 22% of you have not, subscribe to the show. There's a little red rectangle here right now. You click on that. And it turns into a bell. You click the bell, you will be instantly notified every time I upload a new uh, episode of Anglican Unscripted. I know some of you have technical issues, and uh, that's that's a YouTube thing. Don't 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 worry about me. If you have not shared Anglican Unscripted with a dear friend yet, it's time. Let them know. You, you come out of the closet you, that you are an Unscripted viewer. I'm Carl, and I watch Unscripted. Just send that link. And they could be somebody who watches Unscripted too. I'm Carl's friend, and I watch Unscripted. T go for it. Don't 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 let that be something you don't do. Share, 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 share. George, how you doing this week? I'm running around with my head cut off. It's a busy time. Yeah. Palm Sunday is this Sunday. Mm -hmm. uh, I've also got a uh, Kairos team meeting. That's about six hours preparing for a weekend at our local prison here in Florida. And so just the time is just running, running, running right out of my hands to get things done. However, you took time out of your schedule, you and your dear wife, to, to meet me at Cash, Catfish Johnny's to have some uh, dinner this last week. That was a lot of fun. Well, actually, no, I got cheese on my shirt and beer on my pants, so I had to drop them at the cleaners. So <laughs> it was expensive in more ways than just the food. It was fun. Oh, it was a lot of fun. So uh, every once in a while, George and I, we live like an hour away from each other, but we can't get together a lot because he is an extremely busy priest, and I'm a guy trying to fix my RV every other day. So it just doesn't work out that well. So it's fun when we get together on Thanksgiving and one time before we leave. We are leaving Florida, George. We're out of here the first week of April. We're going to head north. I'll announce more of our travel plans as we as we make them as uh we get close to that date i will be looking for acna churches along the way and friends that want to hit up and, and, and grab a coffee F friends of the show so look forward to that let's go down here and check out the news once again uh not once again for the second time george has put together the show notes and they are very well laid out bullet point one Intert tab A, B, C, D. So, slavery reparations not being well received over in the Church of England or in England anywhere. And uh, there's some comments from Lord Sewell that we need to talk about, George. God, this story is not dying to the horror of the Church of England. Uh, the flap over the call for a billion pounds to be spent on uh, slavery reparations plus apologizing for evangelizing the African indigenous people, uh, bringing them into the Christian faith, has gone over like a lead balloon. And now we're three, four weeks out, and we're still seeing editorials in the major newspapers, comments on television. And we had an interview with uh, Lord Tony Sewell of Sanderston, 
And Lord Sewell is, uh, is a black Englishman, and he chaired the Commission on Race and Ethnic Disparities, what was also called CRED, like street cred, get okay. it, ha, ha, ha. Okay. which was set up by Boris Johnson in the wake of the Black Lives Matter protests. And Lord Sewell basically took the Church of England to task. He said the, de the decision to start the reparation fund was political. Uh, in his interview uh, with the Times, he said the church has started the fund for show, and they and he said the, the C of E should get back to getting people into the pews. Now, read a quote from the page piece. Lord Sewell said, we need to have a conversation with the archbishop and ask what he's doing. It would be so much better to focus on bringing people back to a time when the church was packed. So... Here is an unexpected blow from a leading black British man saying that, you know, get off this political high horse, this virtue signaling that you're doing and get to work on bringing winning Britain for Christ. Now, this had even prompted the, the PR, the press department at the Church of England to release a one paragraph statement saying that we don't regret evangelizing African pagans. We don't regret that. But if you compare the amount of time they spent in promoting this uh, reparations uh, committee report and their now uh, shamefaced uh, climb down, oh, they know they're, they're in trouble. They're in tr it's it's kind of like watching wax on, wax off. You know, one week it's wax on, the other week it's, oh, we didn't mean that. We meant that, we don't mean this. And it, it's strange to watch them. It, it's like the... Uh, the Pope's press department uh, for the first two years of his uh, uh, officiating. Uh, every time he'd say something, he didn't mean that. He meant something else. Well, we've given up on trying to figure out what Justin Welby means or what the Church of England means because all they're trying to do is virtual signal. And there's just no gospel in that. There's no, there's no headway in that because all you can do every day is wake up and find out what in, in, in the news today can I virtue signal on? And this week, and this month, it's reparations, George. Well, there's a whiff of sulfur about the leadership of the Church of England. Yes, what do I mean by that? This Satan has entered into the room. They have capitulated to the prince of this world and are pursuing ends to achieve a utopia here and now. They're seeking to march and towards... Uh, a bright uplands where we can all together uh, you know, have wonderful things happen. And they've forgotten that their task is not social reform, it's proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ. They've been captured by the world. And ever since they've been captured by the world, they have been in free fall. They have made decisions that were not godly, and they have allowed the world to dictate what is right and wrong. Now telling us we're at the point now that uh, a, a faithful Bible-believing Christian can say something that can get himself arrested for hate speech. And the Church of England is silent. The Church of England is silent about the rise of Islamist extremism and political activism in Britain. Ever since uh, the massacres in Israel, October 7th, We've seen protests led by the Palestinian Solidarity uh, Campaign. And half the people there are your usual uh, weird beard, uh, vegan, uh, vegan, sandal wearing, you yeah. know, fruity toots who are around for the Council on Nuclear Disarmament and all that stuff. The women of Granham Common and all that, you know, those kooks never go away. So they all will always march. But now the other yeah, now you got 125,000 uh, Muslim immigrants marching through London, making it a Jew-free zone, making it a Christian-free zone. Uh, there's a little thing where the Greenwich Council is demanding that a man with a fish and chip shops who has a British flag and you know, on, on the outside of his store and a, just an old-fashioned, traditional John Bull-type fish and chips shop to paint it over because it offends the locals. Who are the locals? Muslims who despise Britishness. We've reached the point where I believe that the man in the street, uh, or as 
the man in the white van, the tradesman in England, uh, he's done with the Church of England. He's not done with Christianity. He's not done with Jesus Christ. And he may not be done with his local vicar and his faith community, but he is certainly done with that hierarchy of archbishops and bishops and archdeacons and committees and commissions. Um, and he looks at like you know, the Diocese of Truro, 37 full-time clergy with uh, 35 diocesan staff supporting them. And he says, you know, how does this have anything to do with my salvation? Well, I think he, he, the man on the street also recognizes that the Church of England's leadership is more in love with Karl Marx than they are with the gospel. They're more in love with finding a utopia through social action, finding a, a utopia by doing good things rather than what they believe in and whom they follow and who they uh, uh, proclaim to be Lord in Christ. And I, this, and you're slowly seeing this being revealed in the press now, that, yep, the Church of England is completely off course and it has lost its way. We knew this a long time ago, but it seems that the British precious, wait a minute, the Church of England's off course? You know, and they're, they're surprised by it, but you and I are not. Well, this reparations business makes people feel under attack. They're under attack at home by domestic extremists, the rise of Islamist aggressiveness, such that a few weeks ago, Parliament had to was actually influenced by a Muslim mob outside uh, on a vote on whether or not to condemn the war in Gaza or to demand a ceasefire. And the Speaker of the House of Commons, along with the Labour Party leader, basically cut a deal so that they could get out of the building without getting murdered. When Parliament is in fear of the mob in the street, democracy is gone. It's dead. And the average British man see, and woman sees this. And they see their institutions, things that they had trusted, things that they had been sort of there for them always, gone. Um, part of that is the, I don't mean to blame Prince Charles, uh, King Charles, but at least the Queen uh, stood for something. Uh, you know, honor, duty, courage, decency, uh, the virtues that got Britain through the war. And uh, um, she was a remarkable, godly person. Mm -hmm. And now we've got uh, Workshire Will, and we've got uh, Prince, you know, King Charles, and we've got Harry, and we've basically got a cartoon, uh, you know, uh, playing out. And so the things that you could once trust and take pride and elite and allegiance to, church and country and, you know, is England the land of hope and glory anymore? Well, I don't think you're allowed to sing that in many parts of London. Well, I think people will be surprised that, you know, people are arrested uh, by the thousands in England for offending people, for put, posting hate speech on social media, where over in Russia, you're only arrested in the hundreds. Um, and I'm talking about numbers from uh, 2021. I don't have the recent 2024 numbers, but it's appalling by how much being offended has taken over the judiciary and the laws of Europe and certainly the, the, uh, uh, the shores of the British, uh, the uh, UK. So, I, I can't help you if you don't have the freedom of speech. Uh, that was something that was fought for for so many centuries, and uh, it, it's it's completely eroded in a time when the UK doesn't have a conservative party. They have, I don't know what they are. They, you know, conservative name only. I don't get them, you know? Well, there was a funny little thing that to me is almost emblematic of the state both the United States and Britain are in. Um, in Haiti, we talked about this last week, where uh, Barbecue, the gang leader who now running Port-au-Prince, uh, there's some videos of he and his men eating their enemies after killing them and uh, roasting them. Well, NBC and the BBC and a bunch of other left-wing outlets, you know, denied vociferously that, uh, that any cannibalism was taking place in Haiti. And then it was shown on video and reported. And there was an old Monty Python routine about uh, you know, the British Navy, where the, uh, I think it's uh, 
I'm sorry, either John Cleese or Graham Chapman, who uh, said that at, dressed up as an officer saying, there is no cannibalism in the British Navy. And by that, I mean, there's only a very small bit of cannibalism. You know, it, we, we've, you know, you can't trust the BBC, you can't trust NBC, you can't trust the Church of England, you can't trust the Episcopal Church, you can't trust the American government. Goodness me, you can't trust the FBI. I, you and I grew up in the age of Ephraim Zimbalist Jr. and the yes. TV show FBI, <laughs> where they were the squ straightest of square shooters. Yeah. Uh, Joe Friday, you know, mm -hmm. would have, uh, you know, though he was LAPD, that was the model, <laughs> uh, incorruptible wholly dedicated to justice and the law yeah. now what do we have we've got the you know these cases in los angeles when there have been seizures of assets and people find thousands of dollars of cash missing from their houses and fbi agents were pocketing money they stole and the government is basically saying whoops you know we'll discipline these guys these are fbi agents stealing from people's homes when they're doing collecting evidence well, in the, in the late 80s, we uh, put into law something called asset forfeiture. That if mm -hmm. you are caught transporting large sums of cash uh, across the country in your car or flying from place to place, uh, it can be assumed that large uh, caches of cash are drug-related or crime-related and can be confiscated by the government. And you have to prove to the government that it's not of ill means to get that cash back. They can take it and say, you need to prove that this $100,000 that's in your car belongs to you and was not gotten by ill gains. Well, that, that violates the principles of our constitutions, which says innocent until proven guilty. You can't take, oh, no, we can. And this has been something that goes on here and has allowed police departments to uh, take money out of cars uh, in the $20,000, $30,000, $40,000, $200,000 uh, range and use it to fund their police department because ill-gotten gains can be used to fund uh, our our first responders. And this has been going on since the 80s. And, and very few cases now we're at the point where, where we've got officers funding the purchase of power boats yes. and vacation <laughs> homes with money uh, that they've taken geez. in asset forfeiture. Yeah. Uh. Ah, uh, George, I, I wish we had a show of good news. It'd be a 10-minute show, but whatever. Okay, let's move on to story number two. St. Thomas Fifth Avenue, New York, may close historic choir school. Is this a sign of the times? Now, we talk all the time about one of the worst parts of the Episcopal Church is it has very rich churches. They don't, they don't have to be well attended, but they have endowments. They either have, if they don't have endowments, they have land that they rent to Wall Street and make money that way. And they have funds available to them. So even if they're preaching a false gospel, they have the money. And yeah, but that's not always going to work in every situation. And here we have a false gospel church on uh, Fifth Avenue that's saying, okay, we got the money. But we don't have complete access to all of it at any one time. Maybe we should try reaching people, George. The big three in terms of finance, financial strength in New York City are Trinity Wall Street, which has never had many people because of its location in downtown uh, Wall Street area. It's always had tens and hundreds of millions of dollars in assets. Mm -hmm. St. Bart's, St. Bartholomew's in uh, the east side. Um, it's always been sort of on the liberal, trendy side, big parish. Artsy fartsy. The third one was yeah. St. Thomas Fifth Avenue, New York City, and that was always the traditional one. They've had a choir school for going on 75, 80 years, maybe even longer, I'm not certain. But it was always sort of the high church conservative one. Well, uh, rec the previous rector, and I'm not going to say his name, not the current one, the previous rector, uh, he took the church in the gay direction. He brought in gay assistants, you know, people who love the liturgy and all this and that. And the uh, result has been St. Thomas has uh, been in decline, genteel decline. Their current rector came 10 years ago, and he's a music man. And the school's famous for the beauty of its liturgy, its choir, its boys' choir, its music. Well, the rector in the, in the vestry sent out a letter this past week saying, we may have to close the choir school. And in the Q&A put out by the vestry, they, they, they answered possible questions. 
The parish has a $138 million endowment <coughs> and an annual budget of $14 million. However, even they cannot make the wheels go round. They announced they're deferring $4 million in building maintenance. They've cut uh, $250,000 out of one program. And they're saying that we can't, and people say, well, just pay it out of the $138 million. Well, they can't because they're limited to a 5% drawdown. And much of the money is uh, restricted. designated for certain, restricted for certain projects and mm -hmm. things. And here's the, the closing sentence in their letter, the vestry wrote. Putting it simply, the money's running out and the vestry has a responsibility to take action now rather than seeing the general fund completely expended. So the problem is that though it has a beautiful location, a beautiful building, a beautiful tradition, beautiful history, it's not a place of Christian dynamism. It's a place of entertainment. It's cheaper than going to the Metropolitan Opera or Carnegie Hall to see classical music, to go to the church. It's a museum. And it's people who are members are no longer able or willing or enough of them to keep it going. So in many ways, this is emblematic of the Episcopal Church as a whole. It has, the Episcopal Church nationally has billions of dollars in assets and has all these beautiful history and traditions and buildings and liturgies and this and that. But the people are fleeing and the money is going to disappear and run out sooner rather than later. And hey, we're seeing it here in the flesh at St. Thomas Fifth Avenue. I want to back up to the 1990s, George. In the 1990s, I went to a parish in Watertown, Connecticut, called Christchurch Parish. That parish, up until 2003, we'll get to that in a second, had an average weekly attendance in the 300s. The pews were full, the people were happy, we had a choir, we, everything was working. And then Gene Robinson was consecrated, and the church instantly went, and the church was known as a conservative church. But let's not, you know, parse around that. In the Diocese of Connecticut at the time, there were six, seven, maybe eight, I'll give you ten, ten conservative churches uh, amongst the 170. And our church is one of the, the pr uh, prideful conservative churches. Gene Robinson happened, and we went to 60 within a couple weeks. And that killed the church, and we started to have to, uh, from the, our remainder of the time in that church, draw on the endowment fund until it was gone, until we couldn't support the building, until we had to turn the building over to the bishop and go rent space. At, at you know, we were a healthy church. We were, if nothing, if Gene Robinson have it, had not happened, we would have stayed in that church and it would continue to grow. We could have continued to maintain it and continue to meet, uh, to meet the needs of the people of Watertown, Connecticut. That stopped. It's also stopped now for this church on Fifth Avenue. They don't have the ability to meet the needs of the people around them, so they, they don't come to church. They don't give to the, the church. They're, they're just scattered and gone. I don't know why. I'm not going to blame Gene Robinson on that. It's probably a plethora of other, other, other re reasons, George. But this used to be the conservative church on Fifth Avenue. You know, New York City itself is having a hard time. Uh, taxes and the, the crime and all this and that. So uh, we don't want to put, you know... Oh. There are a multitude of factors that leads to church decline. But I think the bigger overall picture is that money is no safeguard or no guarantee of long-term survival. If you've lost the people, uh, the money will keep you alive a little bit longer. You know, they'll get rid of the choir school. They'll, you know, they'll go from six clergy to four clergy to three clergy and so on and so forth. Uh, they'll sell off their air rights above the building. They'll sell off the, you know, the rectories. And they'll be able to raise cash, but they're in the direction of terminal decline. And it's just a question of when, unless there is some sort of revival in the people's hearts. And that's the biggest problem. When you start hanging up that rainbow flag within your church, it doesn't come with money. It doesn't come with people. It's just virtual signaling, and uh, that that 
in my humble opinion, seems to be what happened here. George, our next story is a good story. Um, we're going to talk about the, the Ang- bad for others. <laughs> good, good, bad, bad, bad. It talks about the trajectory of uh, the Anglican Communion, like tech and the Anglican Church in uh, Canada. But uh, the ACNA uh, faithfully publishes their numbers every year. And if you look at the trend from uh, 15 years ago to now, it's a continued growth spurt. Oh, we all have 2020, no big deal. You know, it happened. And it's going up and up and up and up. And something caught your attention. Uh, and you started blasting emails back and forth to myself and Andrew Gross in the, in, the, in the middle of the last week. I said, is this true? Can this be true? What What's going on here? And you put together that the England Church of Canada is now smaller than the ACNA. What? Yes. Yes. The... Uh... Uh, Anglican Church of Canada, a, a, the Anglican Church the in Church. North America, yeah, yeah. which includes the United States and Canada in northern Mexico, sure, yeah. uh, parts of northern Mexico around Monterey and whatnot, um, publishes its memberships and attendance statistics. The Anglican Church of Canada a few years ago stopped publishing yes, its statistics. Did. Well, um, Basically, a statistician, a demographer, was able to compile the latest statistics of the Anglican Church of Canada. And their average Sunday attendance is 65,000. I'm using round numbers. The ACNA's attendance is 75,000. Round numbers. The ACNA, which is 15 years old, is now bigger, has more butts in the pews than the Anglican Church of Canada. And if you look at the individual diocesan statistics, um, there's some dioceses uh, that are just, how should I put it? Uh, it shouldn't be dioceses, you know. Why Why have a diocese of 340 members? Yeah. Uh, so that, you know, there's, there's going to have to be some amalgamation in the Anglican Church of Canada just to keep uh, the lights on. Toronto's fine, uh, but, you know, Vancouver has, you know, when they drove out St. John Shaughnessy, the big evangelical ACA parish. Huge, there, huge parish. Yeah. I don't want to exaggerate, but uh, essentially they cut their attendance in half, yeah. and it's not come back. It's not come back at all. And here, here's another scary statistic. Again, round numbers, 300,000, 295,000 members on parish rolls in Canada. Attendance of 65,000, was that 20, 22%? 22%, yeah, about that. ACNA has 125,000 members and attendance of 75,000. It shows that the people they have are more dedicated, more committed, you know, they didn't break out the numbers of children, but I would guarantee you the ACNA has many, many more no. children. What I was, what we're seeing here is this is very bad news for the Anglican Church of Canada. This demography is destiny. When you're not reproducing, uh, putting younger people in the young people don't give as much as old people. They cost more to maintain Sunday schools and whatnot. Um, but they're the future. And the Anglican Church of Canada appears not to have a future based upon these demographic numbers. Which is probably why they haven't put out their numbers in five or six years. I think once they broke 100,000 uh, ASA probably five years ago, they stopped publishing. Because you can see the trajectory. And they, you know, they said, well, uh, if we... <laughs> Hear no evil, see no evil. See, you know, I mean, at some point they just said, "We're not going to tell you," and we hope that uh, the, the, it changes. And it hasn't, hasn't changed at all. Let's go on here to story four. The Church Times has conducted a survey finding a volunteer crisis hitting the Church of England. It found that amongst those that replied to the survey, twenty-five to forty percent of parishes had only one church warden. Now we're talking uh, wardens, you need a senior and a junior warden to serve, and between 5 and 21% had none. Well, okay, it, it, in my uh, understanding, the wardens are there for the temporal responsibility of the church, what's temporary. 
the, the priests are there for what's eternal. And so if you can't have people there in the Church of England helping volunteer to, to keep what's going on within the church business going on, it's going to collapse even faster, George. Yeah, the Church Times uh, study found that uh, in one diocese, uh, 50 to 60 percent of the parishes had difficulty getting people even to serve on the parish uh, council, uh, which is the equivalent to the vestry in the United States and Canada. Um, the artist's article was basically suggesting that the weight of responsibility for the buildings, for safeguarding, for raising funds from dwindling congregations, is proving too high a challenge for people. The amount of paperwork and busy work required by the National Church is driving away people, as well as the actions. Of, you know, it's very hard to get rid of people from your local church. You can have people despise the leadership, they put, you know, thumb their nose at the bishop. But to get them out of their church or get them to break uh, with the uh, something that's a lifelong habit takes a lot of work. And the demands of the Church of England, and I think of, of its paperwork and bureaucracy, you know, who wants to have to raise money continuously to maintain these historic but expensive buildings that may not have electricity or toilets in some cases? Uh, who wants to go through all this safeguarding rigmarole when you have two kids who show up on Sunday? And you've got to go through all these forms of paperwork or you you've now got to have a plan for capturing uh or increasing the number of uh, minority anglicans in your church on well, rural hereford that's going to be a big job but you still yeah. have to turn in the paperwork um i don't know why but they just the, the leadership just seems to be doing its best to destroy from within the institution well, I think they've lost their core. Every church has its core 20, 30, 50 people who do a lot of the, the busy work, the volunteer work. Um, in your church, you probably have you know, a, a set of people who, always, who are always doing the volunteer work. And then you have the outside, the outside of that realm, the people who like to attend and participate in what the core have provided. And it, it keeps the church functioning. Here in Anglican Unscripted, we have a core five or 600 viewers who watch every second of every show. Praise God, I thank the Lord, I thank, uh, the Lord for you and your viewership. We, I love it very much. But you're the core. The Church of England has lost that core. The people who would, even if it's troublesome to go through the paperwork and do all this, this extra work, would do it because they love uh, Jesus, they love the gospel, they love the church, and it's worth it. People have lost that desire to see that it's worth it. They've lost the core. And that's that's what's happened here, George. Now, the problem is not the lady here, okay? No. I don't want to be no, 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 to we're be not beating yeah. up on people. Yeah. The problem here are archbishops, bishops, and priests are... This is leaf raking season here in florida so this analogy comes quickly to mind yes, it does. Rake and leaf <laughs> in the morning. they flutter off the trees and the bishops archbishops and priests are descending straight to hell because they are not christian anymore they don't have christ centered in their hearts and it's the failure of the clergy all clergy has now caused a reaction among the laity who would actually do the work of the church in of in the temporal matters, the you know plant and equipment and Sunday schools and coffee hours and you know visiting the sick and whatnot. They've it's caused a reaction. The failure of the priestly class mm -hmm. has caused this reaction among the lay people, and it's a bad and it does not bode well does not <laughs> jesus come quickly uh, this is the answer <laughs> story five the episcopal church is solicitating nominations for presiding bishop uh for their louisville general convention this summer uh the names will be announced next month uh on the other side of the coin here the acna is also going to be seeking a new archbishop for the anglican church in north america when they meet in latrobe pennsylvania in june uh, so, 
Here, sign of the times. Uh, the church continues on. The ACNA is strong. It's growing. It's mature. It's now 15 years old. How old does that make you and I, George? Holy cow. <laughs> We've been doing this since uh, I knew the ACNA before they were ACNA, you know. But so, in as such, it's very difficult to watch an, an archbishop go and a new archbishop come in. Uh, and when Archbishop Duncan was the leader of the ACNA, we were comfortable. He's the he's the lion. He's the he's the guy who could bring everybody together. And we watched uh, Archbishop Foley Beach come in office. Ooh, what's going to happen to him? He's going to be eaten alive. No, he wasn't. He, he did a very good job. You know, and he, he still had to deal with the elephant in the room. And even under Archbishop Foley's uh, tenure, they had a meeting on the elephant in the room and decided we're going to keep the elephant in the room. But uh, as such, I'm very pleased that uh, through the Holy Spirit, through the conclave, through the wisdom of the College of Bishops for the ACNA, they were able to choose fully, and now they're going to have to make a choice again. On the other side of the corn, corn coin, uh, they're going to be doing this in the Episcopal Church, and we've seen some winners and losers over there, George. Kevin, I think the I think the deeper point that you're making, yes, is spot on. Yes, it matters whom the Holy Spirit leads yeah. is led leads the bishop in the ACNA to choose, because a bad archbishop can kill the ACNA. I didn't. I you know Bob Duncan. Yeah. I knew he was the he was the bishop who ordained me thirty yeah. odd years ago, um, and I didn't know Foley Beach. I knew of him. I'd never really spoke, I'd never met him, I never spoke with him, I knew of him by sight, his picture, but I'd never, and so when he was elected, it was like, okay, well, let's see, is he going to be able to keep the the feuding uh, parties alive? Because there are factions within the ACNA who wish to burn down the building. They're small, uh, you, they're, but on each side of the issue, the elephant issue. they're very loud. They're yes. very loud, and they're, you know, they are who they are. Yeah. And so the new uh, Archbishop of the ACNA has, they've not eliminated these tensions. They've just had a man of character and strength who is able to unite the disparate factions with a greater vision than the parochial short-term interests of particular parties. Now, the problem is there are some real dead fish in the House College of Bishops, the ACNA, and there are a few real out and out idiots. I'm sure, they're very nice men. They're, 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 okay. They're, they're, but, they're, 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 oh, come on. they're probably wonderful bishops, but would they make a wonderful archbishop? Some of these guys who I have in mind knew. I, I can think of five. I'm like scratching my head. Please don't, please don't. So, yeah. you know, there is the possibility that mm -hmm. they could pick the Joker. Mm -hmm. But then again, I don't know everybody. And God. Uh, We'll see how God's spirit moves among the College of Bishops. But here's where I want to I want to back up. Through biblical history, we know that even picking the Joker, if that's the Holy Spirit's desire, that's a winning move, because they they will transform that Joker into the servant that God needs for that church. Or it could be like Francis. <laughs> yes, I don't. And, I don't I, yeah, I don't and get that. Then Francis. you pay, basically pick the Joker, who uh, yeah. is the the last pope who manages to destroy the church before the Antichrist comes. Uh, so, I know. I know. So, so uh, are we going to get the uh, ACNA Antichrist, or are we going to get the Vicar of Christ? Uh, and so, well, hold, hold on. To our audience, keep this in your prayers. Pray that the Holy Spirit leads the College of Bishops. Okay, continue on. And, but see, again, again, con contrast that to the Episcopal Church, where at the end of the day, it really doesn't matter who the presiding bishop is. Because it's machine that runs the show. It's absolutely. Now, it matters on one level. Catherine Jefford Shorey was the best thing that ever happened to Kevin and George because she just gave an unending source of uh, enjoyment and quotes and silly actions and scary actions. And we could talk every single day about her latest craziness. Mm -hmm. Michael Curry is a personally nicer man, but he put a smiley face on the trajectory of decline. He had his little hobby horses, racism and this and that, and but he wasn't as colorfully inane as uh, Jeffrey Shorey. 
But the trajectory of the Episcopal, unless there is a movement of the Holy Spirit within the collective hearts, the House of Bishops of the Episcopal Church, we're going to have the same old, same old. And that same old, same old is going to continue to gracefully manage the decline. We'll see St. Thomas Fifth Avenue writ large in the uh, National Episcopal Church. Yeah. Now, just like there are faithful, you know, gospel Christians at St. Thomas Fifth Avenue, and wonderful work being done, and some wonderful clergy there, just as there are wonderful churches and wonderful clergy, and even a few good bishops in the Episcopal Church, and we're talking about the institution as a whole. And this faithful remnant needs to hold fast to what God has entrusted to them and just pray that the Lord uh, bring revival, reform, and renewal to the world around them and their church around them. Yeah, indeed. Uh, this is going to, I mean, it's a big summer, bo both for the Episcopal Church and uh, the ACD. Now, I don't know if a presiding bishop can cause the Episcopal Church to change course. That's probably that you take you need much more than a presiding bishop to save the Episcopal Church. Am I right? Well, oh yeah. I mean, you know, at the two thousand three primates meeting in London after yeah. the election of Gene Robinson, Frank Griswold promised to block it, block Robinson's election, yeah. uh, block uh, block his, his nomination. Yes, yeah, right. He had already been elected by. Uh, and affirmed, it had been elected by the diocese, affirmed by the General Convention, and Griswold promised publicly to his peers he would not, this though, because they would say, if you do this, the game was over. Well, he got home, and he was told by the other bishops, you can't block this, you must do this. Now, Frank Griswold could have perhaps headed off the crisis but the crisis would have still arisen anyway, yeah. because if Griswold didn't do it, Jeffrey Shorey certainly would have done it. And that's why we don't want to pick on Gene Robinson. If it wasn't Gene, it would have been somebody else. Mm -hmm. You know, th this was all. This was always going to happen with this trajectory of the Episcopal Church. It was mm -hmm. you know, and the fact that we don't do we have a trans bishop yet? I know we have trans. No, priests. it's the Lutherans who had the trans. The trans bishop. bishop that's right. Okay, all right. But it's it's it, it's got, it can't be that far away. It was in San Francisco, and she got yeah. fired. I think it was the Lutherans. Lutheran. I think it was the Lutherans. She got yeah. fired for for racism against Hispanics. That's right. <laughs> Boy, Lutherans. That's right. Bishop of San Francisco. All right. So if there's anything you need to be on your knees for, it's uh, praying for the uh, changing the trajectory of the Episcopal Church and the new Archbishop of the ACNA. God have mercy on his soul. It's still going to be hard. So let's move on to some other news here. Global South, oh boy, this is going to be a, a tough one, but the Global South meeting uh, this June is in a monastery outside of Alexandria. And uh, they're going to sit down and set an agenda for the Anglican Communion. What? I thought only primates meetings could do that, or only Lambeth could do that, or only, only Justin Welby himself could do that. Well, not really. So let's talk a little bit about who the Global South are, just to, to do people to the program, and what effect they would have if they were to uh, de facto express more power into the Anglican Communion. George, who are they? The Global South uh, are a group of churches predominantly below the equator. That's mm -hmm. where you get the South from. South from, yeah. But it also includes people like the Anglican Church in North America, um, the basically it's GAFCON plus right. the GAFCON churches plus other churches who are not in the GAFCON orbit. The GAFCON at its meeting in Kigali last year basically decided to focus on the work of the church, the project management of the church. The Global South has decided is going to be the group of churches that sort of fights the political and organizational battles for the soul of the communion, and on the big level. The, the high view is that they are rejecting the neo-Christianity practiced by the liberals church, by the liberal churches in the North. 
and that they believe the church's focus should be on proclaiming the gospel, not social justice. Welde and the, uh, and the Anglican left have a Marxist worldview in their minds. Now, what do I mean by Marxist worldview? They believe that Welby and company believes that mankind can be perfected in this lifetime by social action, and that the church's job is to march shoulder to shoulder with the world towards the utopia that man can create. Well, the global South believes that that is a lie. That is Satan, that is satanic, that is the sin of Lucifer, it's a sin of pride, that we are little gods. And it believes that the work of the church is proclaiming the gospel and good news of Jesus Christ, first and foremost, and leaving the social uh, action and agenda. And, you know, Justin Welby is a member of the World Economic Forum, for instance. He goes to that and gives you know, high-minded speeches and, you know, about for helping forge a new global order. Um, Climate change, all that, mosquito nets. All that yeah. Now, this is not to say that those things are not important in themselves, mm -hmm. but the work of the church as an institution is not to do the job of secular agencies and groups, but rather it is proclaim first and foremost Jesus Christ. And there will be seminars on mission and discipleship at the Global South meeting, economic empowerment, leadership formation. But these are all in the context of proclaiming the gospel. Now you could say, well, economic empowerment. Well, that's teach a man to fish instead of giving him fish, preventing the Anglican world from becoming a re re reproduction of Haiti, where we've sent aid for hundreds plus years and the people have never been able to get out of their out of their pathologies um so that the you know self this is very unfashionable but it's the old booker t washington approach to poverty educate yourself work hard build save um honor duty integrity all under all founded upon the gospel saving knowledge of jesus christ so this is an important meeting. Um, there's always, however, the possibility that it gets hijacked by staff. You saw this, Kevin, when you went to an all Anglican meeting. All African I went to meeting South, in South to Kampala. South. Yeah, uh, all African South meeting. to South. Yeah, and uh, uh, it was, uh, we everybody went there for the right intention to find a way to grow the church on the continent of Africa. And the somehow united nations and other people got involved and uh boom it was uh it, it turned into a mosquito net what size is right for you meeting yeah and the global south primates you know, you know let's say you're you're just in body rama the primate of south sudan you're living with government dysfunction tribal warfare incursions by the sudan government uh crisis is still going on in Darfur, you've got a lot of social issues that need to be addressed. Yeah. And so the temptation there is always when somebody says, okay, I'll give you a million dollars yep. for mosquito net program. Let us well, talk. That's something. Yeah. Let's talk. Yeah. But for Justin Body Rama, he's got to hold fast. And he has so far that no, the first proclamation is the gospel because when this money comes, Along with it comes strings that are attached. Um, now, the Central Africans, for instance, are notorious for taking money from uh, the USP, USPG, and Trinity Wall Street and doing these uh, sort of uh, public projects and saying in public uh, international forums the right stuff that Episcopal Church and Church of England wants to hear, but then they go home and they basically repudiate everything they've said to the foreigners because to the mezuzah, mezuzah, mezuzahs? yeah, mezuzahs, yeah, the white mezuzahs. Man. yeah, but because they want, because they need the money to, you know, get things moving. Um, that's a that's something the Central Africans are going to have to deal with eventually, but not. But the Ugandans have been quite clear over the last two three decades, you know, 
if you want you yes we have all these needs orphanages clean water this and that but if you give us money and then you decide then tell us we must vote this way or say these things no we're not going to do that yeah. hmm well we should see and i i said south to south in Calder. it wasn't it was all african meeting i, I want to clear that up south to south was something i attended in singapore it was a great meeting the and all african i did in kampala so and the uh and if, if and for the for the doubters and the naysayers oh well you know we never give uh demands or quid pro quo at the 1998 lambeth conference i took a taxi uh, with ron haynes the bishop of washington yeah back from uh, Canterbury to uh, uh, Gatwick Airport. And Ron was livid because he said, we in Washington have sent so much money to the Church of Uganda, and we told them what we wanted them to do on the human sexuality vote, and they did not let, pay any attention to us. And by God, I'm gonna make sure they don't get another dime out of us. I mean, I heard Ron Haynes, the Bishop of Washington, you know, say this to me um, in the anger of the, in the aftermath of the vote on human sexuality. And it's no secret. That's just how it works. Yeah. But we're not allowed to say that out publicly because it impugns the integrity of both parties. And for people new to the program, Lambeth 98 is where Lambeth 110 was uh, voted in. Mm -hmm. And uh, so... Hi, it's crazy, George. Let's move on. Do we have one more story here? No, that's that's it. That's it. Holy cow, we're we're done ten minutes early. People, well, why don't I, you? I got the Indian corruption. No, and the, no, I'll keep no. that. Up. We'll, we'll put that at bay. People, why don't you guys record two hour shows? Basically, at our age, our bladders and prostates can handle about one hour of sitting, George. I, I, I don't mean to speak for you, but I'm speaking for myself. One hour is my limit. I'm Kevin Cole. Oh, wait, 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 stop, stop, stop. We need to raise money. Okay. I'm sending George, uh, my my executive editor at large, to Latrobe, but I need some money to do it. I'm imagining you a grand or two to, would help. I'm probably up to $300. You guys have been really gracious, but please go to anglican.inc forward slash donate. And, and help us with the cause. We need to uh, raise at least another 70% of funds to get him there. Uh, I don't want him to have to take a, a, a little, small little taxi from Egypt up there. We want to fly him up there and, and be more comfortable. So go to anglican.inc forward slash donate and uh, give to the cause to send George to Latrobe. I'm Kevin Coulson. Oh, well, and, and also, also yeah. uh, if we've got the money, uh, I've been asked uh, if I would go to the Egypt meeting. Oof. But again, you know, that's expensive. And, uh, hey, hope... maybe Tech will send you as a reporter. No. Don't probably. <laughs> yeah, okay. It's time to, I mean, we haven't really asked for money since like 2019 uh, because basically Anglican TV operations have changed since then. Uh, I'll be going to uh, Julian Dobbs, Dyson convention so I, i'm trying to raise money for that but they're gonna help with the plane ticket so it, it's time to start refunding anglican tv and anglican scripted and anglican.inc as we start to uh, start operations post covid i'm kevin colson and i'm george conger and you've been watching episode 848 of anglican unscripted